casa. Welcome back to Progressions, success in the music industry. This is episode number three. Fun fact about today's interview, it was actually the first interview that I recorded. Somehow, I managed to convince my guest to come onto a show that didn't even have a name yet. But we made it through, now we're here, we've got a name, and we've got a show. So it's intro time. I'll try to keep this one short and sweet, and with less required reading assignments than last week. In the interview this week, our guest mentions how important it is to be self-critical of your own work and to be able to step back and look at your situation objectively. He talks about how he will put a song down for a period of time and return to it later so he can get a fresh sense of how the listener might react to it. Anybody that has done something creative understands how easy it is to lose objectivity. I want to make the argument that you should take that same self-reflective approach to your career and your goals, not just your art. If you're not stepping back and looking at your career decisions objectively, you're likely not making a lot of steady forward progress. You might have jumps forward and catch breaks here and there, but you'll attribute them to luck and you won't be able to identify what actions you actually took that helped you hit that milestone. If you're setting big goals and you're breaking them down to small steps, you can feel like you aren't making big gains. But it's the compounding effect of these small moves that are going to ultimately propel you forward. So how can you track this and know you're getting to where you want to be? Insert daily and weekly reflection. By taking time at the end of your day to reset, look at what you accomplished and what the biggest priorities are for the next day, you can see where you're at on the road to your goals. I know, this sounds really basic and a little obvious. So I'll just ask you, when was the last time you thought about your day before you went to bed, looked at where you succeeded and failed, and then prioritized your tasks for the following day? I'm guessing you don't know. And if you do, I commend you. And you're probably nodding your head in agreement with me because you've experienced the positive effects of this. I've read about numerous highly successful people who reflect on their day either as it is ending or before it begins. The only way to set yourself up for success is to know where you're at and where you're going. There are plenty of ways to go about this. I've tried many of them. And I'll be honest and say I haven't settled on the one I prefer yet, but I do reflect daily in one form or another. So what are some examples? Well, it can be as easy as a checklist. You can try stopping your day 20 minutes early, going through and marking things off you accomplished, and prioritizing your tasks for tomorrow. Doing this before you leave work or the studio has the added benefit of a clear and uncluttered mind when you get home. Maybe you want to go for an early evening jog. Think about your day then. I find that some of my best ideas and realizations come to me during a workout. It's also not uncommon for high-performing individuals to keep a journal. You can put down your thoughts from the day, note what your successes and failures were, list out ideas, and reinforce your goals. Putting things down into writing can be a powerful act for your mind. It's an excellent habit to form. And if you think journaling feels like a second-grade homework assignment, Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein. Enough said. Moving on. To close out, I'm going to compare this idea of reflection with something that most people who have made a record are familiar with. The whiteboard. Song names down one side, tasks across the top. The rest covered in a grid of boxes, calling out to be crossed off. Nothing is more satisfying than closing out a long day in the studio by marking some X's on that board. You get to walk out feeling energized, knowing that you got two more final vocals and that one guitar solo you've been fighting with, finally finished. So grab that, apply that to your career, find your daily wins, mark your X's, and get ready for your next day. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, The Complete Producer Network. The Complete Producer Network is a social network created by former Progressions guest and six-time Grammy-nominated producer and mixer, Damian Taylor. I've been hanging out on there since it launched, and I can't say enough about the people I've met. In a world where social media is getting a bad rap for negativity, this is an outlier and an absolute beacon of hope for the internet. If you're looking for a community of people that want to learn from and encourage each other, or you want to find new collaborators, or maybe you just want to discover new music, this is the place for you. In addition to conversations on various topics, there are numerous events, workshops, and courses planned for the future as well. And I have to say, I've found the people and the conversations on the network to be super inspiring and right in line with the ideas of this show. So I'm also happy to say that there's a special room there for Progressions listeners to have open discussions about episodes. The Complete Producer Network welcomes all musicians, producers, artists, engineers, and any other form of music creative to join. So jump over to completeproducer.net and get in on the conversation. 
So today we are going to be joined by the epically talented songwriter and rock and roll frontman Keith Jeffrey. Keith is the lead singer and guitarist of Atlas Genius, a band he started with his two brothers, Michael and Stephen, in their hometown of Adelaide, Australia. They've risen to international success with their first two albums and are particularly popular over here in the States. If you had a radio in the mid-2010s, then you probably had their song Trojans coming at you left and right, and you probably have it stuck in your head now. They've had additional success with two more top tens in their tracks If So and Molecules, and they have a new album on the way that maybe we can get Keith to tell us a little bit about. So I'm excited to talk to Keith today, not only because uh, he's had a career that I think people will find inspiring and upcoming bands and artists can look up to, but because he's a good friend of mine and he's been down in Australia for the whole year and we don't get to hang out no more. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Keith Jeffrey. Hi, Trav. How's it going, man? Nice to be here. Great. Nice to be here with you. Thanks for getting up early. Well, it's not too early over here, but it's, you know, I guess for some people, 10.30 in the morning might be early. <laughs> It's early enough to maybe not uh, not focus. So I wanted to to start off maybe touching on whatever you can share about the new music and where you guys are now, and then kind of jump back to the beginning of Atlas Genius and kind of look for some uh, big turning points or steps that you guys took that kind of mm. propelled you to where you are now. Yeah, well, this present moment, we are sitting on what is a nearly completed album. And full disclosure, a few of those songs you and I worked on together. So... We did a few songs uh, in LA um, that are going to make the album. And then we came back here and, and did some more in our studio, which is the studio we did the first record in back in 2011 and 12, which was the album that had Trojans and If So. So we came back here just to kind of get away from the LA scene because it's funny, you, you think you need to be in LA. It's got this way of making you feel like you, you have to be there because it's the centre of the of the, the musical and creative universe, but it's not actually. Once you get away, you realise, hang on, <laughs> didn't have to be here. Um, so we came back and then tracked up the rest of the, the album. So it's kind of a, it's a bit of an LA, Australia um, mashup, this new record. Amazing. So the, uh, the first record then you guys did basically in... In a home studio, I, I can see your studio because we we have video and it looks amazing now. Is is this the studio that you did that record in or have you upgraded yeah. since then? Yeah, it, it, this is where we did it and it pretty much looked like this. I think when we started some of the tracks on that first record, we didn't have the floorboards weren't down. It was just a bare concrete floor. <laughs> uh, it now has wooden floors. But other than that, it pretty much looked like this. It was a bit of a, you know, build it and they will come situation. Right, right. Field of dreams, you know. Um it was, <laughs> I think what it was is we, it was a labor of love. Like, as any musician dreams of, you know, working in a nice studio and, and where we are in the world, there weren't really any options for that. Um, and we had the know-how to, to build things. So over the course of about two years, we built this studio. So it's been here in existence for probably you know, nearly a decade. So we built it and as we were, finishing it we started to do that record but it wasn't like this grand plan of let's build the studio and then do a record it was just let's have a nice space to record in and to, and to mix in and we knew the value of good acoustics so that was the big thing with this was making sure that it was just really well treated and did a lot of research on how to you know where we needed absorbers and, and bass traps and then diffusers as well so it wasn't too dead so that was a lot of what we were building up for to have this really good sounding space and had you guys been in studios uh, prior to um, Atlas Genius as it was? No, it was always um, it was always us doing it. it was, I mean, it was basically a lot of the time it was me working in, in a portion of this this building. Now it's the whole space, but we had one third locked off, and that was the little it was a little bedroom style studio. It was kind of treated, but it wasn't really. And that was the first iteration of it, and then. Um, so no, it was never really. We never really worked in commercial studios. There was the odd moment here and there where you might do a song somewhere. But plus, this the town we're in is about an hour away from the main city in, in our state. So it's not like you know, it's ten thousand people. It's not a huge market for commercial studios. Right, right, right. Okay, so so let's. Do you mind? I know you've probably told this story a million times, but do you mind touching on on Trojans and and maybe reflecting on? a few things that you think made that song really pop off the way it did? Yeah. I mean, I've definitely thought about that a lot over the years um, because it was a, 
obviously a huge turning point in our careers, in my personal career as a, as a writer and a producer. I'm not sure exactly where to start, so I'll just sort of, I might move about a bit. But when that song started, I remember us starting to write that song and it was nothing like what it ended up being. It was the same tempo, same key and same chords, but the feel was totally different. It was, it was it felt double time compared to what it is now. It was really busy hats. It was Mike playing um, 16s instead of the eights that he plays in the, um, in the intro. And it was more, felt more like killers, you know, it was more of a, had a sort of a killersy vibe. You know, that really like busy hi-hat thing that their drummer would often do on those albums. Somebody told me all those kind of songs. Um, Cause that was, you know, ringing in our ears. It was probably only a few years after that. And um, so we started that and it's kind of the way that we've continued to work on songs is it started and, and then we got to a certain point and then you go, okay, I'm kind of either, I'm either tired of this at, the, at this very moment or I'm just not feeling inspired or I just, you know, let's move on to something else. And so you put it down for a bit and then pick up another song and then kind of either start a new one or work on another pre-existing idea. And so it happened over the course of like, these chunks of time where we might spend you know, a couple of days on it, then maybe step away from it for a month and come back with fresh ears and then, kind of analyze, okay, well, this is good about this, but, but it kind of loses me when it goes to this point or, or maybe, or maybe it doesn't start strong, but there's this really interesting point. And then you want to kind of extrapolate that moment and see where, you know, maybe that's the keeper and you can kind of cut the other stuff away. And I think as far as changing the process of how I wrote and how we wrote, those songs were really important because up until then it normally would be, I'd write a song you know, the old sort of the way you'd imagine like people did in the sixties, right? Without digital recording gear. And then the band would come and you'd kind of just turn it into a, from a singer songwriter to a full band, add a few little bits. And that's the song and not really question anything too much. And there's a strength in doing that, but what we, this new approach that we took, which I don't know if it was conscious or not, maybe just happened was that you'd be really critical of it. Like, okay, so let's, Let's not finish the song necessarily. Like it might exist without, maybe it's missing a bridge vocal or there's no bridge melody or even section or maybe it's missing a chorus melody or whatever. But you've got bits that you like and then you're constantly reevaluating, which obviously is dangerous because you can, you can throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> but there was this thing of like, okay, well, it's got to be really exciting. And if there's a moment that just turns you off, if you get to like, 50 seconds in and all of a sudden you're like cringing inside or, or there's just a bit that doesn't take you to the where you want it to take you, then maybe that it's okay to totally unplug that section and put in something new. And Trojans was one of those. And I specifically remember the way that that song evolved was there were the four chords and the tempo and this drum beat that was too frenetic, but there was this moment in the bridge and it's actually still the bridge in the song or part of it is, um, where Mike went to eights on the hat and it had a bit more groove and there was just something about that moment. Like that's kind of feels right there. What if we take that sort of drum pattern, just, you know, it's not a crazy beat or anything. It's just a kind of a pop rhythm. But what if we take that with the hi-hat accent in it? What if we take that and make that more of the groove for the song, kind of scrap the guitar parts that early on and then sort of rebuild it up that way. And in that, in doing that, I found I was able to write a melody over it that felt right. And that's the first melody in the, in the song. And so that was kind of a bit of a big moment. Like, wow, like you don't have to, you know, you can, you have the, you have the right and the ability to change even like fundamental things like the groove of the song and it can get you to a really good place. Yeah. Cha totally change the inspiration. Totally change it all. Yeah, exactly. And there's some parts you might keep. And the good thing about that is there, there will be moments that in that initial version that you wouldn't come up with if you were writing over the the final rhythm or the final vibe so you can kind of pick and choose and it's a bit more like i guess if somebody's working in ableton or you know they've now added this option to um, logic as well where you've got the clips instead of it being sequential you can you know sort of chop and change between little events you know little clips and it's a bit like that i guess but you know more of a we're just doing it mentally it's like a modular approach to uh, to songwriting. Yeah, to some, somewhat of a, a modular. Yeah. 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 So it sounds like 
a big change for you guys was kind of like taking these moments of reflection, looking back at all the music you were working on and editing and revisiting things. I think a lot of people push music out the door faster, but obviously there's something to living with it. And even, even a vocal performance probably is different, you know, a month after you wrote the song than it is the day you wrote the song, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it is a dangerous way of doing it because you can really, there's a paralysis that can set in, as I'm sure you experience as well. When, when you work on something too much, you can, there can be something that was really good. You've heard it 50 times or 500 times and now it no longer does anything to you, but maybe it's still good. So you do have to balance. And that's where I guess stepping away and coming back can be good as well. Cause you can take this approach of, you know, reworking things then step away again and maybe a month you've forgotten about the frustrations and just you're hearing it as close as you can to the way that the listener is going to hear it. Right, right. I kind of have this this philosophy that in order to get anything done, obviously the first thing you have to do is you have to start doing it. But then uh, there's a flip side to that where you have to you have to also stop doing it at some point yeah. as well. I mean, I could I could tweak on a mix for for a long time, but eventually it needs to needs to be done. Yeah, and, and often those first moves are the, are the best moves as well. Exactly, yeah. Your, your first gut instinct is always always the strongest. So the, yeah. that song, you guys were unsigned when that song was starting to get big, or you were signed? Yeah, the, no, there was no, no label. There was nothing, there was no management. There was no team at all. Fully independent. You guys had done the whole record on your own. Yeah, the definition of independent. There was no, I mean, we'd mixed and mastered it as well. We just, you know, used some UAD precision uh, limiting and, and multi-band compression to uh to master it and it was all mixed here as well amazing what was uh what was a key moment for you guys when you realized that 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 song was catching fire and that things potentially could change for you do you remember what that was mm, there, was, there, there were little moments and then there were the big moments because for that particular song and it remains the biggest song in my career the little moments early on were I was studying architecture and my friend Emma, um, she was my best friend in the class and we hang out all the time between classes and and I played her the song and she said, oh, can I have a copy of it? And so I just sent the MP3. And she had played it for one of her friends somewhere, they're at a dinner or lunch or something. And her friend was a musician and she played it for him. And his reaction that she then obviously told me about after was, he was like, oh, fuck, I hate these guys. This is what I want to write. Like, I, I like this so much that I, that I feel hatred towards them. And she told me about it. And it was the first time and it felt like a genuine, it wasn't like someone got, man, I really like this. It was like, it was, a, it was a strong reaction. And I thought, oh, that, we're onto something. If this is the kind of, like, I was feeling that the song was special. Right. But if, if, we're, getting, if we're invoking that kind of, kind of uh, reaction, if you can evoke that, then maybe you're onto something. So we had a few moments like that. But nothing crazy because, you know, a lot of friends are still do that. Oh, it's nice. Yeah. And you don't know because, you know, you've shown your friends 50 songs over the years and they've given you the same reaction. So it, it all means nothing <laughs> uh, at that point. So, and then we, Mike um, bought the domain, you know, bought the website, atlasgenius.com and, and put it up on a couple of sites like SoundCloud and didn't really think much of it because why would anyone find it? You know, it wasn't, we weren't promoting it. We didn't have a name. So... Um, and then we kind of just went about our business. And then I think it was about a month after he did that because he'd registered the band website and he had the band, you know, got the email address. And, and there was a link to the email address on the SoundCloud, I think it was, or somewhere. And a few people had emailed that address and he hadn't checked it for, you know, since he set it up because why would anyone be emailing? Because he hadn't given it out except from that website. But people like, a couple of music lawyers and, and a couple of labels. There was a label out of London and a label out of Japan and two lawyers, music lawyers had emailed us saying they really liked the song and can we talk? And that, some of those emails might've been sitting there for a couple of weeks, I think, from memory. And, um, and so they were like, what, this, someone's playing a prank here. Because A, you don't think anyone's, after years of being a musician and not really feeling like you're getting anywhere, you kind of, you, you very much lower your expectations. You know, when you're 15, you think you're going to be a star overnight. And then, you know, after doing it for years and years, you know, well, this is probably not going anywhere. So we thought someone was just taking the piss out of us. And um, <laughs> we thought it was one of our mates or someone. Yeah, and then it turns out they were legit. 
And then, and it was literally, and it snowballed. There was, there were just every day there'd be a few more emails. It was spread like wildfire. I don't know how the industry would catch on that quick, but I guess word was just getting out and people were telling each other. And then all these, every A&R guy, every label messaged us. And it was really overwhelming and also kind of worrying. You're like, well, how do we capitalize on this? Because it's not going to hang around. What's the best move? Do we sign with this manager or that lawyer? Or, you know, who, what do you do? Because, and also they're all sniffing around, but they're also, they're not just going to offer you a big contract straight up, you know, and you get a few little, kind of shark type labels are giving you some, here's a singles deal. We'll give you 10 grand to own this song, which in their mind could be what it became. And then they've got no obligation to put anything else else out. But compared to what you've been offered your entire career, it still seems exciting, but you kind of know that maybe that doesn't seem right. So it was kind of a bit of a cat and mouse situation for a fair while where we didn't know what quite to do. And, you know, the managers that are coming up to you first, are they the best ones to go with? In hindsight, probably not. You know, you, you tend to get the sharks kind of come around first. Um, and, and we definitely had that, you know, we, we made some bad choices. But you have to make it a move. You can't just, we had to do something. So we did the best we could at the time. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. So it really is just a, really is a story of just viral explosion to us to a certain extent then it, it was really kinda... yeah, it really was viral yeah it's it's was funny because it, this what year is this this is like 2011 that's 12? 2011 12 so we put out mid 2011 by 2012 we'd signed to warner brothers the beginning of 2012 so it was about six months between it us putting it out just you know on just online and existing without promotion to then we had a deal six to eight months or something. It might've been like, it was early 2012. We flew to the States to meet with a bunch of labels. They all flew us out. It was one of those moments, which apparently is not super common where they all kind of agreed to pitch in and like, okay, we're all going to court this band. So we had four labels, three of which decided to pay and one decided to not pay and <laughs> play it <laughs> cool. Um, and cause they thought, that, because the, the, com- the thought from that label was that we're, we're so much better than these other ones that we don't need to, yeah. Almost reverse psychology. We're not gonna, we're, we're not gonna buy this band a drink, right? Um, you you want to sign with us so bad. You we're not, we're not even gonna it. pay, yeah, yeah, a couple of grand for your flights and accommodation. Anyway, so four labels um, brought us out to the states. Yeah, amazing. So then, so let, well, let, let's jump forward a little bit. So obviously, everybody knows what happens from there. How did you guys feel afterwards? I mean, all of a sudden, all right. So you've you've got a hit song. You're probably touring all over the place. You've been courted by every label. Did you guys have like any kind of mindset changes? What? How, how'd you start album two? Was there? There had to be a little pressure, but maybe not. Maybe you guys just went. Did you go well, back to even Australia? album one, there was like. Well, even album one, there was a lot of pressure. So just to go back, kind of for a minute. Yeah, album one was there was this song existed, but now we had a deal for you know you've got to deliver a new an album, hopefully at that level, you know. Here you've got a major label deal, a really big major label deal, all this pressure, and a song that was still climbing, right? It took it was in the charts for, for a year. That oh, song wow. was it was like <laughs> it was nearly breaking records. Like it just didn't go away. It was even charting um, in the top twenty or so for the entire year, but then after a year it becomes recurrent, so they just stop counting where it's at. So it just drops off. Even if it's still at number one, hypothetically. It doesn't, they don't show it as number one because it's been in there. Basically, the, the industry gets bored of it being in the charts. So they like, they cut it off. Yeah. So you're it was banished. in the charts for, yeah, you're banished. So for over a year. So it was kind of climbing and climbing and climbing. And eventually it got to, to number three in the American charts. And it was there for a long time. But at the same time, the reason we couldn't get to number one, and I think we would have, was that Muse had Madness and Bla- uh, the Black Keys had Lonely Boy. They're two biggest songs ever as well. Yeah. So they're two, two songs massive, no one's massive heard of. Band. Yeah, I mean, two of the biggest songs of the of the last fifty years, <laughs> you know. And so, so we we kept like we were just just underneath them. So, I mean, still number three was great, and it was right. there for a long time. But um, the, uh, back to my point it, is that it was a there was a lot of pressure that I felt of like okay, we need to deliver an album. I mean, and. We have to go back to Australia. So we've gone over there to sign the deal and it's all, you know, it's very exciting. And then you're back in the studio that we built. Okay. It's like, well, now you're going to deliver some magic. And we didn't have any of that pressure when we were doing Trojans. 
there was no expectations. It was just like, man, oh, this feels good. Yeah, this feels good. I think it's done. You just print it and then put it up on a website. Whereas now it's like, hang on, we have fans now. What? Like people are emailing us. Like, when's the next music? When's the new music coming out? And that's all totally foreign because, you know, you've just been playing gigs to, you know, 10, 50 people, if you're lucky, in local bars every so often. So, as well as playing cover shows to pay the bills. So, did that affect the writing process? Yeah, it, to- it really did. Yeah, it was a, it was a really difficult one um, for me because there were some songs, you've got these ideas, not every song, like some songs came out, like If So, which did really well, and, I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm proud of that song. That came out afterwards, and there were these songs that, but then sometimes, you know, you've got, there was actually what was really difficult for me was we had a deadline because we had our first US tour booked. So our manager booked... And which, you know, was, was you needed to do, you needed to capitalize on it because you can't just have this song existing on its own and not necessi- not tour really. So we had a song that was on radio and to capitalize on that, we had a tour that was booked in August of 2012. So we knew, like, say we signed, it might have been Feb or March. We had this chunk of time that we had to finish an album in the studio because once we got on the road, like how were we going to continue to get this album done? And we didn't want to wait too long to put out new music. So that was, we did drop an EP. So I think when we started touring, we had an EP, which is another two songs on top of Trojans so to make three for an EP. But yeah, we, there was that like, okay, you've got four months or so to like write and finish an album. And like we had, I mean, these songs in the past have just been labors of love that you just do in spare time. Now it's like you're full time doing it. So yeah, it was, it was weird. Crazy, crazy adventure. It's uh, probably uh, a lot of kids who hear this will, just be wondering um, how how come they're not the most viral thing on SoundCloud right now. But hey, some of them are. You know, it it what happened to you guys still happens, I think, and maybe even maybe even more so with just the increased access to Spotify, and you know, independent artists can put their music out and and make a well, yeah make a splash. Well, I'd like to make a comment on that. I think that yes, it can happen to anyone. That it is, we do live in this era where. Yeah, you put a song out and it can it can have a Trojans can occur. But what was the one thing I think we were careful about is we didn't. There were a bunch of songs that we were working on and things that never made it. And and, and over the years as well, this is like years of writing. So it's not just about putting out the first song. And I mean, Trojans was a great song. We worked really hard on writing it and really hard on the production of it so that it was the right. The aesthetic was right. The the flow, everything was there. That story wouldn't have happened if we'd have had. You know, if we'd have put out five albums of crap, you know, half developed, <laughs> half written songs, and then dropped the Trojans, I think had people found that song and then realized, and then gone through the back catalogue and there was just all this rubbish, maybe <laughs> it might not have happened. And also, you know, I think that you've got to be, we were really critical of ourselves. That's the thing, like to a fault, like really hard on ourselves about this needs to be right. Not because we were trying to get signed, not because we were trying to tour the world, just because we just didn't want to put out shit songs. Yeah, well, I think the uh, the authenticity of of what the artist is looking for, I think, is is what the uh, what the listener actually attaches himself to. I mean, you could list yeah. out a million pop songs that sound similar, or a million alt rock bands that sound similar, but something makes you know this person stick out from that person. It's the stuff that your friends were probably reacting to when you were when they were begging for MP3s of Trojans. Yeah, and I think that like growing up, there were those kids that I went to school with, you know, the uh, musicians around the scene. That everything they did, they thought was was Bohemian Rhapsody meets the Beatles. Like, and and, <laughs> the, and they really weren't self critical. And and I that and looking on and thinking about that, and it's, and I still know these people. I'm sure you do as well. Where they think that just because they did it, it's somehow magical, and that they are the magic. And it's the art that is the magic. You know, you you, you create something and. And knowing when it's right is the real important thing. Because, you know, like, I mean, I can play guitar. We can all play to a certain level. It's about what are the common, what's this combination create? What's this picture, this painting, this, this song? How does it make people feel? And I think that's the problem I've noticed with so many people. I can see these people with 20 years in fighting the same battles that they don't realize they're fighting is that they don't, they're not critical enough of what they're doing. I think you've really got to take, okay, you, just because I had fun doing this or just because there's a cool trick with the drums or just because it's me doesn't mean it's good, you know? Just because my mum and my, my girlfriend tells me I'm good 
doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. And I think right. you've got to really be honest with yourself. Is this a pile of shit, or is this is this halfway there? <laughs> like, is there a is there a good moment in this? Uh, you know, that that needs to be sort of explored. But maybe there's some other stuff in here. Like maybe just because I can play guitar really good doesn't mean I should be soloing in the song. Or you know, or because I'm a drum a drum teacher doesn't mean I should be doing drum solos all the way through. You know, because sometimes I mean, think about Trojans. That that song is an exercise in restraint, I and mean, that's some of the most basic drumming and guitar parts that we've ever played. But that's what the song needed, you know, because it's all about sort of listening to the melody and hearing that, hearing that raw kind of vocal. I think that's probably partly why it um, comes across. What do you think instilled that in you, in the, the being critical of your work and, and being able to, re- to look back and see that, hey, you know, maybe this song wasn't the best or maybe that guitar solo was... W- w- is there something in your life that made you that way? Yeah, yeah. I think that um, it's my parents. You know, we're all a product of our parents a lot of the time, most of the time. And I've seen that, especially my dad. My dad's really creative when it comes to designing and building things. And um, he studied electrical engineering. I've seen him go through this process, not with songs, but with building a device or you know, designing computers back in the in the in the eighties, like or in the nineties, like where there was just this long process of. I could see him like beating himself up, maybe too much, but not stopping at the first iteration of that, whatever that is, whatever that product is, he would go, you know, this can be better, you know, and just like prototypes. So like most companies, when you design something, it's not the first version that you put out. And I think with songs, that can often be the case as well. And there, uh, and I will preface all this with that there are so many times when an honest acoustic guitar being, and like a Bob Dylan, like singing a, a raw you know, an imperfect song into a microphone is still amazing and that's great. But sometimes you need to really just rework things and, and sometimes scrap it. You, know, you might think you're going to write the next um, Strawberry Fields or something and try it you know, and it doesn't work. So that's okay. Like you learn something by doing it, but put it down. Maybe that doesn't need to go out. Right. Let's jump forward to, to now. You guys are prepping an album that is almost, almost ready, to, ready to go. Is there anything that you've been doing to get ready, what was the process like on this record, or any any steps that you felt were maybe new to to y'all's process? Or yeah, I think well, there was more collaboration on this on these songs. You know, a couple of the songs were done you know with with our good friend Corey Britz. We, we wrote that, and then you and I as well, obviously. When we went to LA, I was really open to the idea of well, not initially, but then eventually, I became really open to the idea of collaborating. And just, you know, like if I'm in the room with someone, there's no point me ramming my taste down their throat. You've got to be like, okay, let's, we're here to collaborate. Let's see what you've got. In saying that, of the 50 or 100 collaborations that I've done, whether it's for my own songs or for someone else, it's every so often you find someone you really click with. You know, like you've probably found that as well. Sometimes yes, you're a client, yeah. you just do it because it's a paid client, but and that's a different thing. But when it comes down to a labor of love for something you're doing for your self if every so often you find somebody go okay whether it's an engineer or a co-writer you go okay i can hang with this person and i really love what they do and it's just fun and pretty much ultimately that that they're the best songs that get written within those with those teams i think so working with um with Corey, who's you know a great friend as well as talented dude we're messing around in the process you get a good song out of it you know, if it's you, me, Mike, and and Corey in the room, it's a, it's a good hang. And our guitarist Dave, who joined probably a year ago, who we've been friends with for a bunch of years, English guy. He and I have been writing together a lot. So it's his, it's his few a couple of really good teams. I think I don't believe that having ten different teams on ten different songs on a record is probably going to be as strong as finding a couple of one or two really good little scenarios. Right. Well, I mean, it goes back to the, the authenticity. And like you said, having a good time in the room. I mean, we obviously had a great time working together. I think that that comes out in music, but the, uh, so when, when you guys, uh, you guys came to LA, you did a lot of the, the blind date songwriting sessions and, and bounced around. Did you write for other artists or were there Atlas songs that became songs for other artists? I don't know if that's something you would say, but. Um, yeah, well, uh, I did write with some other artists and probably a bunch and, and some of those, you know, not every one of those comes out. That's the nature of the industry. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did, 
I wrote a song with Michelle Branch that came out, and then there was another song that I um, sung on as well. So the two songs on her record that came out, I think it was 2016 or so that record came out. Uh, and then there's a, an indie band called Dreamers that I wrote a single with them called Shooting Shadows. Uh, and I wrote a song with Andrew McMahon called Brooklyn, You're Killing Me. So, um, and there's been a bunch of others, but they're kind of some of the notable the notable tracks. Just to, uh, to close out here, um, I like to try to, pretending as if I've done a podcast before, you know, <laughs> the first recording, and I'm going to sit here and say, I like yeah. to uh, close. On this show, we like to do this. On this show, what we normally do. Um, I like to put people on the spot a little bit and just say, what's your next big goal that you're going after? And do you know what your first move is to go there? Good question. It probably, it doesn't have to be a music goal. It can just be what, you know, what are you doing? Where are you going? Um, I think it would be to increase my output because I've spent the last 20 minutes talking about how I want, like we made this conscious decision to kind of slow down and be critical of things and, and sort of be methodical and, and go over things with a fine tooth comb. But I think there's a, there's a middle ground um, and, and it's kind of good to explore both, both ends of that spectrum and then find somewhere in the middle where you still put out music on a regular basis and also do it for fun as well because that process can take the fun out of it. And I think yeah, anyone, if you're trying to write a hit, it's not a fun thing. If you're feeling that pressure, like, oh, I've got to write a hit. <laughs> and you can hear it. Like, you, I feel like you can hear it with a lot of artists. Like, oh, here you go. You're trying to follow up that hit. I yeah. can hear it. You've got the same freaking bass line and the same snare sound or whatever. Oh, and it's just, it's like, it'll be an uninspired version of the big single. Um, try to find the fun in it and make sure that you, and, and part one of those is, is having the right group of people. It could be two of you or four of you. That right scenario in the studio. I really enjoy collaboration, like having, doing it, with, whether it's with my brothers or my, you guys or, or Dave or whoever it might be, just that's when the good stuff happens. Like you said, like when you're having fun, you're not thinking about those, that can keep that pressure out that, um, those, the demons, you know, they're like, Oh, I've got to make a hit. So this year I'd like to, um, if COVID allows us collaborate more, <laughs> <laughs> but then you can you can do it online it's not quite the same but you can do it but when it when i can get back in the room with people just really um move fast be you know be critical of it but move fast and, and get things out do you feel like uh you have a lot of pent-up creative energy being being in isolation yeah i i think that you go through phases i'm sure you agree and I, i've gone through a few months of not feeling like i want to create um, partly because you get to the end of a project and you've put so much effort in it. So now it's more about getting that out. But, yeah. um, and also just, we've all been kind of sitting around in isolation. So there's not a whole lot of inspiration yeah. popping up necessarily. How have you felt? You felt the same way? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, try to, try to stay inspired, but yeah, you know, COVID is, uh, playing a game with all of us. These are so, weird times. I know. It's very it's part weird. Of, I was thinking about what kind of song I'd want to write now. And there's that thing of, you know, I could sit at a piano and do this like really like, and maybe I will, but, you know, do these really introspective, sorrowful songs, my version of a Radiohead album or something. Yeah. Or just go, fuck this. I want to get out and just keep it energetic because it's been such a, I mean, that, that part of you just wants to go out and, and socialize and party and just, you know, be around humans. So, I think Maybe a part of everybody right. wants to uh, go out and socialize. <laughs> yeah. Do I want to dwell? Do I want to dwell around a little piano? And, and, you know, and the world's going to open up and everybody's going to see each other. The first thing you're going to do is go to a studio, get behind a piano, like turn all the lights off and stay by yourself. <laughs> Pro yeah. I don't not. know if I'm going to want to hear. I don't know if I want to hear that at that point. And probably most other people don't want to hear it. Well, you're going to, you're going to jump on, on stage. You got to be dying to get on stage. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just even just, yeah, any kind of performance would be nice. Yeah, well, wow. and people say, "Oh, why don't you just go online and do a stream, a streamed uh, concert?" Oh, well, I mean, no, <laughs> it's not. It's not the same. <laughs> Stare at my <laughs> iPad while I'm <laughs> while a bunch of people comment <laughs> critically. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, Keith, thank you so much for coming on. I think um, 
I had a lot of fun. I hope I hope you did. Um, yeah, it's great. Yeah. I mean, I can't you believe we're well, wrapping it up already. I thought I thought we were doing the five hour Joe Rogan well, this, experience. This is just part one of six. Oh, okay, great. Okay, yeah, totally. <laughs> so awesome. Well, um, if uh, if you want to let our listeners know where they can find you or how they can keep in touch with Atlas Genius, I mean, it's not hard to find you guys on the internet, obviously. But if there's anything you want to let them know. Yeah, no, just you know, go to Spotify or Apple Music or buy a buy a vinyl. There's some vinyl somewhere. Yeah, buy buy some vinyl, stream some songs, follow some people. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Keith. This is great. Cheers, Joe. And that does it for episode three. So thank you, Keith. Always love hanging out with you. Um, and if you enjoyed this, please uh, subscribe and share it with others. And also, don't forget to jump over to completeproducer.net and join in the progressions conversation over there. All right, I'll see you all next week.